we've been doing this thing for 12 years now. Um, these are, are programs that are funded by NSF and they happen all over the, the country. Um, the Ocean Sciences has, I think, 25 of them and in, in the country. And they're pretty competitive to get the program. And then within the programs, they're also very competitive to get in. So we get on the average of anywhere from 200 to 300 applications for these. This year, we got 260 applications and uh, uh, we accepted 17 students. And I'll show you a little bit about that. But these programs take a lot of people to make them happen. So um, if the, the students, they are paid internships and that those fundings come from either individual grants that we each hold or from the NSF program um, on its own. And there are some other funders that include Colby uh, has some money for their students, um, NOAA, NASA, Sea Grant, and then the uh, Rodney L. White Foundation also supports one students. So while the students get paid, the mentors don't. And so I always like to give a round of applause to the mentors because it really is a service um, that they do. And that's not to say that we don't get excellent work and also excellent uh, uh, thought power that comes out of these students. Um, we have a lot of help in the background that includes Roxana and most of the students know Roxana. She helps triage a whole bunch of the applications um, dealing normally under uh, normal circumstances of helping to get people here to all the logistics that sit behind there. Nicole's also really instrumental in this. IT and particularly this year, Kevin Gway has been uh, a big help. Um, we have professional workshops, which I'll describe in a second, but uh, Nick uh, Record, Catherine Mitchell, uh, two people from my lab, Abby and Mora, both were really helpful. Uh, Rachel Kaplan has did the blog that you'll see. Um, she also did a workshop on communications and Barney gave one of the, the uh, seminars during that, um, the workshops on navigation. So this year, our students, I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to get a student from every state. So these are colleges that they're at, not where they live. And um, uh, this year we got a new one from Alaska. So we got to fill out a new part there. And actually I think Iowa, this is our first one from Iowa too. So we're pretty happy about that. Um, a lot of them came from Maine and, or the majority seemed to come from Maine. And overall we had 17 this year. And then I take this whole map and I superimpose it on every year that we've done this. So again, it's 12 years. We've had, I think about 160 interns. Um, and we're covering most of the states. There are some internal states that, that we haven't been able to hit, um, but we have most of the aquatic states. And NSF considers, or the government considers uh, these under the oceanographic funding. So the Great Lakes count for uh, oceanography and we get those, all those states that kind of border the, the uh, um, Great Lakes also. Um, so, oh, right. And so in here, um, over the years, we've, uh, gotten a lot of funding to bring the students here to pay their stipends. Um, we've spent nearly three quarters of a million dollars in student stipends and about a quarter of a million dollars in housing and transportation for these students. And this all gets funded uh, from the outside. So it, it's in addition to all the stipends that the students get. Um, and then we have a lot of follow up with our students. So we try to maintain contact um, with our students just for future cruises, working on publications. And so these are our funding cycles. We've done three funding cycles. We've just started a fourth one. Every year is competitive. So we write a new grant to get funded and we put in novel kind of ideas about how we wanna, how we wanna do our program. Um, but over the years, we've had 94 of our students go to meetings. So we take them to international meet, we take them to large oceanographic meetings that can be international. They get hosted in Hawaii every couple of years. Um, which is like going overseas. Um, we've had 24 publications come out of these students where the students are authors and these are peer reviewed publications and uh, they've gone on 14 cruises and one of our students this year, Hannah, is gonna be going out on a cruise I think for a long time. <laughs> She's on a long cruise. Um, pretty excited about that. Um, so this is our first online program and this is what we looked at and this is, if you grid out your view right now, this is what you would see. Um, every time we met, we, we looked at each other this way. And only now did I find out the height of some of these students, <laughs> which is really great. 
there are some big ones and some really small ones up there. Um, but it's been an interesting way to do it, and it's been uh, personally pretty fulfilling. But um, yeah, it's been pretty fulfilling. I mean, it was an interesting way to, to run a program. So the program itself, it's got this individual science project and these round tables. And the idea here is that a student works on a project. They, they get, it's, it, I view it as an opportunity. This is not school. This is an opportunity to embed yourself into something. And, and we all do it at our own pace and, and our, our own capacity to, to do it. Um, but as they're doing their own individual project, we meet every two weeks and we talk about our project and we, we build our story as we go along. And with that, they all learn each other's projects. And so it's really a great learning experience for me personally, but also I assume for everybody else. And so we get a condensed version of how people are progressing through this. Um, they, there's a professional development part and that had a cafe code, which was a coding session that they did every Friday. And it was aspects of dealing with big data um, access using uh, programming languages and, and questions like that, how to you know, archive data and stuff. We had a journal club where they all read a particular paper and then they discussed it. Um, they did a science communication workshop, a marine navigation workshop, and then they had primers on Excel and stats. Um, and those were kind of early on in the session. They also attended these science seminars, um, which were a typical seminar like you're going to see today. Um, although we, we give them a little bit longer, they're 40 minutes usually, and then time for question and answers. Um, not only were they dealing with a pandemic, but they're also dealing with a lot of civil unrest out there. We had a diversity and inclusivity workshop that they participated in, and this was done out of the uh, NCAR, the University of Colorado. And then we had a, a discussion about just applying to grad schools. And it was really just meant as a primer to think about it and to give them some people or faces that they know they could turn to as they start to think about their applications. So this 10 week science project, um, it was, it's really designed for a hands-on experiential piece. And if they were here in the lab, some of them would be working with big data sets like they all did this time. And some of them would be doing um, lab work. They'd be doing bench work or field work in that kind of way. All of the experiments in this online version, they are all of these uh, projects, they, they had to design experiments or look over the design of experiments. And that's really a, a core um, piece of being a scientist. They collected data in some way or another that could be collecting data from other journals, collecting data from raw images, collecting data from just sensors that, that streamed there. Um, and one woman got to come to the lab and actually collect data in the field. She, she got to get her hands and feet wet. Um, they analyzed the data and then they interpreted the data and they could, they're gonna present that interpretation today. So their deliverables have been these proposals. So they had to early on put together this idea of what they thought they were gonna do this session. And it, it changed through the, through the uh, semester, but it's that first approach of putting forward an idea and beginning to talk about it. And then they present their data to their other students, as we talked about. They produce the poster that you'll see in their booklet, and that's typically what they'll take to a program or to a conference. And then they give their final presentation. I do this because this is a piece that I just pull out of every one of their posters or talks, and I just try to throw all the images from all the different projects that happened, and they were diverse. I mean, it went from looking at uh, bacteria and the what divides out a clade of bacteria, all the way up to the role of seabirds and uh, th their effect on, on uh, local ecosystems. People did satellite data, people did whale modeling data. I mean, there's a gamut, a whole, a whole array of really fabulous work that's out there. So it's gonna work like this. I'm gonna turn over the screen and each of the students are gonna put up their slides and they're gonna introduce themselves. Um, They'll have 15 minutes, so depending on when they finish their talk, there'll be time to, to ask some questions. Students, again, will get the first question to ask, and then after that, uh, I'll start to read them out of the chat book. So if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to put them in there as, when they come to your mind. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And the first person up is Dylan. So you can load your screen up, Dylan. Here we go. 
And at your convenience, go ahead and start. Well, thank you, David. Thank you for the wonderful introduction as well. It's always so nice to hear you. <laughs> All right, well, let me just move the Zoom screen a bit so I can see. And howdy and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dylan Hallbison, and I'm a senior oceanography major at Texas A&M University. This summer, I was working under the guidance of Dr. Benjamin Twining at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. And our project is entitled, The Power of Three, comparing dissolved, particulate, and phytoplankton, trace metal, micronutrient stoichiometries in the Atlantic and Pacific. Now, I know that was a lot of syllables, so I wanna break it down into some digestible points. And the first one I wanna bring up is trying to think about trace metals in the Atlantic and Pacific in regards to dust and primary production. And in order to do that, we need to understand that there's varying volumes of dust carrying trace metals that deposit um, into the world's oceans by the winds. And now this establishes uniquely different trace metal conditions in each basin. And that's important because trace metals like iron tend to limit primary production and ultimately influence the Earth's carbon and nitrogen cycles. Now, the second point I wanna make is stoichiometry. What is that big word? Well, it's the study of atomic ratios. We know for any one molecule of water, we need two hydrogens and one oxygen. Thus, the ratio of two to one is a stoichiometry. And that's an idea we wanna carry with us for the remainder of the talk. So the next point is, I've said trace metals. Well, what are those? They're elements found in low concentrations in the environment. And here highlighted in blue, you can see a handful that are important to biogeochemists. But for the purposes of this talk and this research, I'm gonna highlight manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. All right, and, mat and cadmium, can't forget the cadmium. And so why do we study these seven? Well, they're micronutrients, i.e. they're important for the physiological and um, biomolecules within phytoplankton. They help them undergo different chemical reactions that help phytoplankton grow and sustain in the world's oceans. Now, like these micronutrients, there's also macronutrients, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And these are also incorporated into biomolecules, such as DNA, enzymes, proteins, phospholipids, and they're equally crucial for physiological development in phytoplankton. Now, Early on, these caught the attention of chemical oceanographers, and in 1958, Dr. Alfred Redfield found that there was a consistent stoichiometric relationship both in the phytoplankton biomass and the dissolved pool in the water column. And now, because there is a consistent stoichiometric relationship in these two mediums, they considered that to be coupled. Well, now, how do we unify these macro and micronutrients? I'm gonna orient you to some depth profiles. So here representative of our macronutrients, we have phosphate in the red box. The red dots indicate the Atlantic concentration and the blue dots indicate the Pacific concentration. On the y-axis, we go from zero to 3000 meters depth. And then on the axis, on the x-axis, we're going from zero to four micromoles per kilogram. Now representing our micronutrients in the blue corner, we have cadmium, which is an equally consistent um, depth profile, except for the x-axis goes from zero to 1.2 nanomoles per kilogram. And as we can see, there's some similar trends. They're low in concentration in the surface, and if we, they increase in concentration with depth. If we highlight the upper 100 meters where these phytoplankton live, you can see that their presence influences the concentration of both macro and micronutrients. Well, that led chemical oceanographers to establish what is known as the extended redfield ratio, or an equally coupled um, stoichiometric relationship that extends past the macronutrients and incorporates the micronutrients. Now, how did they do this? Well, they took some water samples and calculated the stoichiometries of the dissolved pool. Then they took some phytoplankton samples and did the same thing. And they found that these stoichiometries were pretty well coupled. Now that's great, but they're missing an important detail. And that's that there's other particles in the water column, right? Well, who are these particles? We're already well oriented to the biogenic green dots that represent phytoplankton. 
But now let's take a look at the orthogenic blue squares, which aren't exactly like the picture that I have here, but for the sake of communicating what a precipitate is, I listed these. In detail, these are actually the precipitated minerals like iron or manganese oxyhydroxides. And then last of all, the lithogenic particles, which are the yellow hexagons that represent the dust that is blown in off the continents that I first mentioned in the first slide. Now, why are these important? Well, different particles have different chemistry and each one of these particles undergo a unique chemical process that either allow, that allows them to take up or redistribute metals throughout the water column and they all act differently. Now that's an important thing to keep in mind because the Redfield coupled idea is based on the biogenic alone. Now taking all of this into account, we are here at the Twining Lab scratched our head and drew a hypothesis and that's that we hypothesize that there's a consistent decoupling between macro and micronutrient stoichiometries and that's because these particles are more than just phytoplankton. And they also release or take up metals at different rates, which will therefore influence the relative concentration of metals in the water column. Oops, sorry. And how did we do that? Well, we took a comprehensive data set put forth by the GeoTraces International Study. And then we took two, we looked at two specific transects, the EPZT that ran from Ecuador to Tahiti, and then the NAZT that ran from Portugal, south to Africa, and then west to the United States. Now it's important to keep in mind that the GeoTraces comprehensive data set, IDP 2017, joins the dissolved particulate and phytoplankton data for the first time ever. So looking at these data concurrently, we calculated the dissolved particulate and phytoplankton metal to phosphorus ratios to give us a better understanding of the stoichiometry going on in both basins. We then calculated the biogenic, orthogenic, and lithogenic particle pools in both basins to give us a better understanding of the particle chemistry that may be influencing our metal concentrations. And then simply we generated some plots to bring these data to light and give us something to look at. And what did we find? Well, I'm glad you asked. And I wanna first orient you to the importance of particle fractions. Here on the left, you see the Pacific and on the right, the Atlantic. The y-axis is a percentage, so it runs from 0 to 100, and on the x-axis you can see in the Pacific we're looking at cobalt, iron, manganese, and nickel, and in the Atlantic we're looking at cobalt, iron, and manganese. Now, without really squinting our eyes, we can see that there's some differences going on, but if we dive in a little deeper, we can see that these trace metals are associated with different fractions. To turn your attention, if we look at cobalt in the Pacific, you can see that the biogenic is substantially influential. But if we compare it to the Atlantic, it's less influential there. Okay, well, now if we take a look at the Pacific once more, we can see that the biogenic fractions for each metal tend to be a little more influential than in the Atlantic. So obviously there's some different particle chemistry going on. And altogether, if we draw a conclusion from this, we can tell that the biogenic particles are often a small fraction. As you see, the yellow lithogenic dust and blue orthogenic precipitates tend to dominate the color spectrum on these plots. And now that's an interesting note because the, uh, pre the first studies done by Redfield and those who contributed to the extended Redfield ratio studies only take the biogenic into account. But here we see that the orthogenic and lithogenic are more influential. Now, I want to orient us a little bit to stoichiometry and for the sake, sake of brevity I don't want to show all seven metals so here I'm going to show cobalt and iron. Here we see the Pacific on the left and the Atlantic on the right. The blue dash line is the accepted measured value for cobalt to phosphorus and then our y-axis runs from 0 to 0.35 millimoles per mole of cobalt to phosphorus. Our x-axis shows the dissolved biogenic, orthogenic, and lithogenic phases and I put a maroon bar at the bottom just to remind us that the three on the right are particles and the one left out is a dissolved. Now diving into this, we can see that in the Pacific, the biogenic is the most influential. And like Redfield says, it lands pretty close to that line. But in the Atlantic, we see that the orthogenic particle is the most influential. Now highlighting the dissolved, we see that it is, it's lower than the dominating particle fractions. And so then we can start to see some evidence suggesting that these stoichiometries are decoupling. Now, 
to add a little fuel to the fire, we're going to look at iron as well. Now, it's all the same, except I do want to point out the y-axis. In the Atlantic, we see that it runs from 0 to 70 micromoles per mole, or millimoles per mole, rather. And in the Pacific, it is, runs from 0 to 12. And I just wanted to point out something neat, that that's the presence of the Saharan dust blowing in off of the African continent thus making these two basins uniquely different with trace metals, as I first mentioned in the first slide. Now, diving into this a bit, we can see that the lithogenic particle fraction seems to be the most influential in the Pacific, the orthogenic in the Atlantic, and there again, the dissolved is lower. Just adding more evidence that these are starting to decouple, and we may need to think about Redfieldian coupled relationships a little differently. And now, tying this all together, what can we conclude? Well, first, that as simple as it may sound, these trace metals are not just phytoplankton, and that the particle fractions are different amongst metals and between basins. Second, that the lithogenic and orthogenic particle fractions should be considered whenever we're thinking about this Redfieldian coupled idea. And that's because each one of these particles contribute more or less micronutrients to the water column dependent on their relative chemistries. And then last, that these particle and dissolved micronutrient stoichiometries are decoupled. And that kind of starts to tease apart this idea that's been relied upon. And that's just because they weren't privy to the knowledge of the other particles that may be there. That's the power of this IDP geotraces data set. And then all of this has a broad scale impact. You know, uh, trace metals limit production in the oceans. And this research leads us in the right direction to better understand the dynamics of internal metal cycle. And with that in mind, we have the opportunity to enhance our models of micronutrient distributions and that could possibly shed new light on the carbon and nitrogen cycles that impact all life here on Earth. And with that, I just wanna say a big thank you to the NSF for funding this program. I wanna say thank you to all of those at, the, at Bigelow just really for being wonderful leaders and mentors and examples to us um, and making us really feel at home from various parts of the country. Um, thank you to those in the Twining Lab and Dr. Alessandro Tagliabue for their contribution to this work. Uh, big thanks to those in the Geotraces community that provide stellar data to the IDP 2017 data set. And then I, I have to say it, thank you to all of those on the Department of Oceanography at Texas A&M and just helping guide me to where I am today. And last of all, thanks to everyone in the cohort for wearing a big smile and just getting to know each other as best we can, given the times, and it really has been a pleasure. And with that, I'd like to open up the Zoomlandia for some questions. Nice job, Dylan. So if there are questions from the students, feel free. I have a question. Um, yes, Dylan. Could you please explain why nickel was left out of the Atlantic particle fraction data? Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't catch it. No, I'm just kidding. Of course. Okay, so uh, there was a little bit of trouble with our comprehensive data set, even though it was incredibly large and accelerated my cataracts by four years. It did leave out the nickel, copper, and cadmium data for that NAZT transect. We do have the measurements, but uh, they're just in a separate data set that is far more complicated. So at this point, Ben Tupper, Ben Twining and I are working on some R script to incorporate the two so that we can move forward with that nickel analysis and add it onto that plot as, as you saw. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Your talk was amazing. Thank you. So we have two minutes left. Is there a student one or? Okay, here I go, Dylan. Okay. Are there seasonal patterns to the stoichiometry rates or ratios? I'd imagine so, yes. So I don't know too much detail about seasonal patterns, but the, the relative concentration of these metals are going to be dependent on how the ocean is cycling. And that, of course, is dependent on how hot the water is or the physical movement of the water masses. So I'd imagine that there is, but I'd still have to do a little more research to tell you in specific. And there's, this has got to be short. Uh, how about dust from the Chinese deserts over the Pacific Ocean? Absolutely, yes. Uh, dust from the Chinese desert. Okay, um, 
I'm trying to orient that into a question in my mind. Yes, dust from China is influential. Um, it does carry iron, manganese, and cobalt, I'd imagine, because those are often the particle, the, the metals that are incorporated into dust. Um, but they will get thrown into water masses like the North Pacific Intermediate Water that will then move its way into the Northern Pacific and just kind of roll into the physical dynamics there. I'd also have to do a little more research into my physical oceanography to answer in full. But yes, definitely. That's great. Round of applause. Thank you, Dylan. Of course. Thanks, y'all. Hey, Jade, load it up. All righty. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Ajay Patel, a rising senior at the University of Florida. And this summer I've had the pleasure to work alongside Dr. Doug Rasher and his team at Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Um, we were tackling the question of uh, the potential influence of fish eating seabirds on kelp forest ecosystems in the Gulf of Maine. And so, So uh, the nature of my project is a little bit different than a lot of my uh, peers. Uh, coronavirus effectively prevented all field work from being conducted in the summer of 2020. So I, I shifted my perspective a little bit. I uh, decided to basically plan for field work and methods, project proposal, things like this for the summer of uh, 2021. And I concurrently um, have been working on an honors thesis incorporating nesting data, as well as life histories, uh, natural history, um, information as well. And this data was, has been provided by the Gulf of Maine Seabird Working Group and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so um, seabirds in a global context, they are, they're not very, they're not doing so well. Um, 346 uh, species of birds are the group of seabirds and 28% of these are globally threatened with 5% being critically endangered and 10% being near threatened. Um, 50 per, about 50 percent of known seabird population trends suggest population declines, and most of these are uh, attributed to anthropogenic effects or caused by people. Um, illustrated in the pictures below, you can see entanglements or bycatches of some various seabirds, not in the Gulf of Maine, but these are just examples of uh, what can happen when they get caught in nets. Most of the times they perish and, are, um, and die, which is unfortunate. Um, this is important because seabirds are often connected to biogeochemical cycles, similar to uh, how Dylan mentioned. Um, populations reduc reductions on a global scale could foreshadow uh, small changes in these local ecosystems. So an example of this could be that um, in 2016, a researcher named Croft uh, suggested a coupling between migratory Arctic seabirds and cloud radiative effects. So what this means is basically that the ammonia from uh, ammonia volatilizes or comes from the uh, becomes a gas from bird poop and goes into the atmosphere and clouds and other climatic phenomenon can form around these uh, little droplets and have much larger effects than just uh, what one would expect from bird poop. And so here is a, uh, a representation of or th this is what I think the coast of Maine looks like. It could be wrong, but this is, uh, this is my best interpretation. And so we have uh, the birds and the fish and the seabirds eat the fish and excrete their waste in the form of uric acid and other uh, macronutrients. And so this um, waste enters the ecosystem on the islands and the water. And the idea is that it will enhance the uh, kelp communities surrounding these islands. So it may enhance growth or uh, community structure and this should radiate all the way down the trophic food web, back up into the birds again. And so um, nitrogen is important on many different scales. There, you can focus on it on a global scale, which I have chose to do on this slide. So comparatively, this is a, a little bit confusing, but uh, the breeding seabird flux of nitrogen is about a third to a half a percent of the size of the total nitrogen fixation in the entire ocean. 
So basically it is, um, this, I'm, not, I'm not comparing uh, avian nitrogen as a, as a fixation source. I'm simply saying that it, it is a third of a percent to a half a percent the size of the total nitrogen fixation in the ocean from bacteria and whatnot. And I think uh, this is a, a quite, quite a lot in honesty. This is a, a big amount in my mind. And it also accounts for about 11% of the nitrogen fixed through lightning, which is also cool. Uh, this diagram is a, uh, a penguin. It has been uh, called the best scientific illustration by a couple of different uh, journals and sources, as well as some people at um, Bigelow. And it just uh, is a representation of a penguin defecating and it pooling and stuff like this. I just thought it was super relevant and pretty funny. Um, our current understandings of population trends of seabirds overall on a global scale are uh, quite insufficient in all honesty. Uh, globally, seabirds are understudied because the areas that they inhabit are very remote. Oftentimes they're just flying around over the sea and when they're not, they're on these remote islands away from people. And so that makes them hard to study in general. But uh, initially I thought I conflated, um, I thought that uh, the Gulf of Maine was also understudied in terms of seabird ecology and stuff like this, but I was uh, initially mistaken. I was comparing it to my understandings of uh, songbird research and stuff like this, how, uh, how much more information there is for stuff like that. And there's way, way less information for seabirds in general. However, the Gulf of Maine is a, a little bit of a refuge for seabird research. So 15% are, uh, there are 15 species in the Gulf of Maine across four taxonomic resource, uh, fact, taxonomic orders, excuse me. And the, uh, the leeches storm petrel is the most abundant along with the herring gull and common eiders. Um, 180 islands have nesting gulls while there are a significantly limited number of islands with terns, puffin, and razorbills. Uh, most of the management undertaken in the Gulf of Maine is by the Gulf of Maine Seabird Working Group, which is a, uh, a group containing governmental agencies, non-governmental agencies, um, tasked with protecting these birds in the Gulf of Maine. And so their biggest uh, project is the removal of gulls, minks, and herons related to predation on these islands. And in the left corner, you can see a graph illustrating population trends of some of uh, selected species in the Gulf of Maine. On the left-hand side, you see a pair slash nest count. This is basically a um, uh, if this is the pair count along with the nest count, which can be added together to give you an estimate of over, over time. And this data set is over from 2019 to 1999. So it's been the last 20 years. And you can see that over this time, the common turn, which is the line all the way at the top where my pointer is, has increased while this trend has not been seen to the same extent in many of the other species. Um, more specifically, a lot of the other turns have had declines while some of the gulls have had, uh, like the laughing gull in this blue line here has seen a population increase over the same amount of time. Uh, seabirds are an important vector for transporting nitrogen between the kelp forest and terrestrial islands in the Gulf of Maine. This has been proven in uh, one specific paper I will mention in a little bit. Uh, community structure is often a very important uh, aspect or is often dictated by the nutrients from other ecosystems. So the avian component of nitrogen cycle is uh, very understudied in my opinion, and it may prove to be an important uh, source for nitrogen in these kelp forest ecosystems. There was a previous study in the Gulf of Maine in 2006, which investigated a very similar question. Um, it found a significant correlation between ammonia and nitrates in the soils and nesting densities. So basically it was saying that wherever these uh, gull and cormorant nests were, that there was uh, significant amounts of nitrates and ammonia in these soils. And it, um, it also thought that this was a good predictor for plant species composition. So to me, this shows that this phenomenon is, uh, is present in the Gulf of Maine. So the nitrogen is subsidizing some communities, terrestrial communities on these islands, but the extent to which it subsidizes communities in the surrounding uh, aquatic ecosystems is unknown and unstudied. So this brings about the research question, to what extent do fish eating seabirds impact kelp forest ecosystems surrounding rookeries on the coast of Maine? And so 
our working hypothesis is that kelp forest ecosystems will see an increase in species diversity, nitrogen enrichment, and algal uh, and kelp density in biomasses. Uh, our study sites will, will occur across 30 islands, which will be selected from a larger group of suitable islands. These islands will have 70 uh, kelp forests within 75 meters of their shoreline. And the, uh, they will be sampled during the summer months between April and July. Uh, treatments will be categorized either by island or based on level of seabird occupancy. This will be determined later once the quality of the data is um, assessed. Surveys of the seabirds will ideally occur through April, uh, from April through July, and will conduct, consist of um, apparently occupied nests and species identification. I may also consider grouping birds based on foraging because this may elucidate differences in uh, nitrogen concentrations or something like this in the soils uh, because of their diets or foraging strategies. Pelagic fish surveys will also likely occur and will consist of two 50 meter band transects at five to seven meters deep. Uh, benthic surveys should also occur, which will allow us to determine species composition, distributions, densities, and biomasses of all these kelps. Uh, half of the transects will have their kelp removed and weighed for biomass estimates, and this can also be used as a proxy for uh, primary productivity in these ecosystems. And so uh, nitrogen isotope sampling will also be an important uh, component of this. Ni the nitrogen isotope N15 is important and important uh, in tracing um, nitrogen through some systems because it, it's a radioactive form of nitrogen which uh, kind of accumulates in uh, the higher trophic levels. So if we see this in um, plants and lower trophic organisms, it should suggest that the nitrogen is cycling through the ecosystems via seabirds or seals, depending on um, which organism the nitrogen went through. This has uh, been a slight problem for me as I have not been able to rectify how I will uh, incorporate seals into this project, but continued analysis and discussion will occur. And with that, I would like to thank the uh, National Science Foundation for funding this REU program, along with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Maine Fish and Wildlife, and the National Audubon Society for providing data, specifically Dr. Linda Welch for fielding my incessant and annoying emails, quite frankly. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Doug Rasher and the other scientists at Bigelow Laboratories for their support and dedication to our education, as well as my parents for their love and financial support. Thank you guys all for listening to my talk. And I will be taking questions. Way to go. Uh, there are two minutes. Uh, does, are there any questions from students? So I'm going to the list. Any ideas why the common tern is doing so well while other seabirds, other seabirds seem to be declining? Uh, and does the common tern have some sort of lifestyle advantage over the others? Um, that is unclear. I know that it has a less extensive migratory path than the Arctic tern. The Arctic tern actually has a super duper well-known uh, migratory path that goes all the way from uh, Maine basically to the Antarctic and all the way back up every single year. It does basically two uh, a large circle circumnavigation of the globe, which is pretty cool. Um, that may ha impact some of their um, life history or survivabilities over time because that's a that's a pretty big journey. But um, overall, I'm I'm not sure why they are doing well, why other birds are declining, and neither is neither are the other scientists. Other examples of other ecosystems, tropical reefs. Reading Doug's, here you go. Are there examples from other ecosystems? For example, tropical coral reefs where similar phenomena are present. Yes, there is an example. Let me let me load my um, presentation back up really quickly. You've got one minute. Don't feel rushed. <laughs> so in this diagram, this is a, a diagram from a paper regarding coral uh, similar uh, phenomenon in coral reefs. The, the birds basically um, 
gathered their uh, diet, their food in the form of fish from these uh, coral reefs and the nutrients were deposited on the islands and ran off into the ocean and um, basically fertilized the coral reef ecosystems and allowed for a nutrient subsidy. And the guano influence, as you can see, decreased as it they got away from the islands. So the, the proximity to the birds and the concentration of guano is important. Nice. Great. Thank you. Alexis. Hi, my name is Alexis Etter and I attend Truman State University. Um, my mentors this summer were Dr. Nicole Poulton and Laura DeBelzik, and I studied the predator-prey dynamics of Dinophysis and Mesogenium in Booth Bay region of the Gulf of Maine. So in general, phytoplankton play a key role in ocean ecosystems. They impact biogeochemical cycles and they also serve as the core of food webs. And the Gulf of Maine is one of the most diverse and complex marine temperate areas in the world and has a highly productive phytoplankton population. But over the course of a decade, the Gulf of Maine has warmed faster than 99% of the global ocean. So as ocean conditions change, phytoplankton dynamics, um, such as the timing of bloom onset and the peak abundances also change. Um, for example, blooms, also known as red tides, are occurring more often, more intensely, and in different areas than they used to. So used to they were occurring a little farther out in the ocean, but now they're creeping in towards the coast a little more. And in the picture here, minimize the screen, um, we have an example of a bloom, which is caused by the dinoflagellate noctiluca. That's what it might look like. And then problems caused by blooms have been seen in other areas, such as the Gulf of Mexico and also the Chesapeake Bay. So since these are warmer areas that are having these problems, as the Gulf of Maine heats up, we might also start to see these problems here too. And toxins released from organisms that form the blooms could harm the aquaculture industry because of the bioaccumulation of the toxins that they release and then they bioaccumulate in the tissues of um, uh, organisms such as clams and oysters and other bivalves. So the picture here is from a shellfish farm on the Damariscotta River, which is just one location that could be affected. So with that, it's important to talk about the difference between harmful algal blooms. So there's non-toxic blooms and then there's also toxic blooms. And non-toxic blooms occur when colonies of algae grow out of control. And then when the algae die, it creates an anoxic zone. And this is because of the decomposition process. It's using the oxygen in the water. And then it can also just occur in such a thick layer that it can clog the gills of fish and invertebrates and some other vegetation. Toxic blooms, on the other hand, are where the organisms in these blooms release toxins. Um, so there's different species of dinoflagellates that produce harmful algal blooms, and dinophysis is one of them. So dinophysis releases ochidaic acid, which causes diuretic shellfish poisoning. So as I mentioned, this is one thing that can be affecting the aquaculture industry. And also these um, toxic bloom niches are expanding due to climate change. So picture below is the molecule ochidaic acid, which is kind of causing the problem. And then here is dinophysis and it's consuming mesodinium, which is one of its known prey species. So as I mentioned, dinophysis was one of the important toxic algal species and it's at the top of the food chain, this little food chain that I studied this summer. Um, it's a dinoflagellate and it's mixotropic, so it has different forms of obtaining the energy it needs. It can consume other prey or it can also photosynthesize because it keeps the chloroplast from mesodinium and these are responsible for causing toxic blooms. Dinophysis is preying on mesodinium, which is a type of ciliate and it's mixotrophic, so it can also consume other prey or photosynthesize because it has chloroplast that it obtains from cryptophytes and mesodinium is responsible for causing non-toxic blooms. So finally, we have cryptophytes, which are a type of autotrophic nanoplankton. So these guys photosynthesize, and they have chloroplasts that contain chlorophyll and phycoerythrin, which are two types of photosynthetic pigments. So at the end of this dynamic, you end up with plastids from cryptophytes in mesodinium and in dinophysis. So for a while, when researchers were trying to culture dinophysis, they were just putting them with cryptophytes but it was discovered in 2006 that mesodinium was the missing link in this dynamic. And the process of taking chloroplasts from prey and sequestering them in their own cells is known as kleptoplasty. 
So with this dynamic in mind, we were able to ask several questions. How are mesodinium and dinophysis abundances related? Do different collection sites have similar, similar dynamics? When did peak abundances occur and how does this compare to previous years? And do environmental factors such as salinity and sea surface temperature affect plume formation? So to answer these questions, we looked at time series data from 2016, 2017, and 2018 with an emphasis on 2016. Um, samples were taken weekly to bi-weekly at one meter depth at high tide. So we have three locations in the Damariscotta River, the upper, mid, and lower river. And then there's also one location at the main department of Marine, Marine Resources Dock, which is the site of the old Bigelow Laboratory. So these river buoys, which are the CNET river buoys, um, have hourly monitoring of biophysical parameters. So from those, we got the salinity and sea surface temperature, and then the organisms could be determined from the water samples later. And then at the dock, um, weather and sea surface temperature and salinity were recorded at time of sampling. And then later, the organisms could be determined from those water samples. So we want to know what organisms were in that water sample, and to do that, we need flow cytometry. So it's brought back to the lab, and then the sample is run through the flow cytometer, and a pump draws the sample through, and then the cells are forced through in single file, and they pass in front of this laser. And then based on the characteristics of the cell, the light will scatter. So the angle that it scatters at depends on the size and the shape and the refractive index of the cell. And then it will also fluoresce depending on the pigments. So chlorophyll will fluoresce red and phycoerythrin will fluoresce orange. And then this information is gathered by the computer and output into this um, scatter plot with side scatter here and fluorescence on the y-axis. And so yeah, each of these um, little dots represents a cell. So from this, we can determine the total cryptophytes and the total phytoplankton. So this traditional flow cytometry is used for determining um, the amount of particles. It's used for high density, smaller particles. But we wanna look at the phytoplankton, but within this population, we might not know the different species or genera of ciliates and diatoms and dinoflagellates, and we're looking specifically for mesodinium and dinophysis. So for that, we used imaging info analysis, the flow cam, to enumerate dinophysis and mesodinium. So an aliquot of the sample that was put through the flow cytometer is then run through the flow cam. And it's an instrument, yeah, it can do everything that flow cytometry does, but in addition, it takes pictures. So as the cells pass through, a camera is triggered and it generates this image library. And then we can go through and look at the morphology of the particles and visually classify them. So this is just an example. And I've highlighted the mesodinium in pink and the dinophysis are in blue. So then once we have these total numbers of populations in a sample, we can graph them over time to see how the populations are changing and their dynamics. So this is the result of the 2016 DOC study. We have time along the bottom. First, we have the cryptophytes, and this is plotted against the secondary y-axis and cells per milliliter. So compared to the other organisms, the cryptophyte populations are a little steadier throughout the year. Then next we have mesodinium, which has a peak in May. And you can see that as mesodinium populations are decreasing, the cryptophytes increase. And then as mesodinium is increasing, the cryptophytes are decreasing slightly. And the stars represent where um, the organism went below the detectable limit in these samples. So next we have dinophysis, which has a peak in June. And again, we can see this dynamic where as dinophysis is increasing, we see a decrease in mesodinium because they're consuming them. And then when there's less predators in the water, there's more prey in the water. We can also see that at its peak, there was no detectable mesodinium. Um, so one thing we noticed in general was that there was a higher density of organisms in this dock study than in the river system, which I'll show you in a second. So for example, at its peak, mesodinium or dinophysis had 3,000 cells per liter, but in the river system, the highest it ever got was 400. So it's about an order of magnitude difference between the two. And we're thinking that this could possibly be a result of the location because it's in this sort of embayment area. So it might be keeping them more protected and also, yeah, more contained. So now for the river system, we see that mesogenium peak abundances are occurring a little later in the year compared to the embayment. Dinophysis is still most abundant in early June, but at a lower density than in the bay. 
And again, the stars represent where it's below the detectable limit. So we see that it's below the detectable limit in over half the samples. And there's also less fluctuation in the populations. So for example, here, dinophysis is ranging from about 20 to 3,000. But in the river system, it only ranges from about 20 to 200. And also, mesogenium drops below the detectable limit several times, but not in the river system. So what this is suggesting is that dinophysis is playing less of a role in controlling the mesogenium populations in this river system. So now looking at the 2016 um, sea surface temperature, we also looked at salinity, but that didn't vary much across sites. So before looking at the temperature, I expected that the embayment and the lower river system would have the most similar temperatures, but it actually turned out that the embayment and the upper river had the most similar temperatures. So then with that, I expected that they would also have the most similar dynamics, but as we saw, the river system has a separate dynamic than the embayment. So we also looked at data from 2008 to 2011. So 2008 to 2010 was kind of pre-analyzed and then we added on 2011 to this. So it's at a high resolution, so it's a lot easier to see the dynamic. So um, the line represents a running average. And we can see that the cryptophyte starts increasing in the spring and then they peak in the summer and fall. And then as there's this increase in mesodinium populations, we see the cryptophyte populations decrease. And then also, interestingly, here, um, when we see this increase in dinophysis, we see a really sharp dip in mesodinium because they're consuming them. And then as there's less mesodinium in the water, there's more cryptophytes. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, so then also, um, we know that mesodinium does well in warmer temperatures. And it's even persistent. Um, I don't know if my mouse, okay. It's even persistent in the colder winter months. So this suggests that if it weren't being consumed by, by dinophysis, it might be um, persistent throughout the entire year. And in general, if we just look at the overall years, they do have pretty similar trends between all of them. So now comparing this to temperature, um, it's the same graph you just saw, but below I have the temperature over the course of the four years. So we see that as it starts to get warmer, the dinophysis um, population starts to increase. And then when it's the warmest, we see the largest dinophysis population. And then as we see the temperature start to slope off, the dinophysis population also starts to slope off. So the main takeaway from this is that there are several factors that might be controlling these dinophysis populations. Um, and those are prey availability and also the temperature. Okay, finally, we have the 2008-2011 versus 2016-2018 data. And the main takeaway here is that they're just occurring, the organisms are occurring at lower densities in recent years than they have in past years. So if we look at dinophysis, for example, it rarely gets above 1,000 cells per liter, but here in every peak, it's well over that. Um, yeah. So in conclusion, the embayment has higher population densities than the river system. Dinophysis is likely the main factor that controls mesogenium populations. There's peak abundance timing differences. There's been a lower density of organisms in recent years, and salinity was consistent across sites. The upper river and the embayment had the most similar sea surface temperatures, and we would also venture to say that if a bloom were to happen, it would be more likely in the embayment. So for future directions, it would be beneficial to sample at a higher frequency. So in the picture, I have um, an instrument, the imaging flow cytobot. So it's basically a flow cytometer that's constantly deployed in the water for I think up to six months at a time. So it's constantly sampling the water and can take like 3,000 pictures an hour. So that would be really helpful to kind of get around the sampling inefficiency and also get a better picture of the dynamic. Analyzing between 2011 and 2016, and then once we have this decade span of data, we can model it. Um, I'd like to examine the um, older years physical data, um, such as salinity and maybe nutrients. And then also investigating the dinophysis populations, um, predator populations, because copepods, can eat a lot of dinophysis, and then also investigating the role size in these. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for the funding for the program, everyone at Big Little Labs for all you did for us this summer, especially David for kind of organizing this, and my mentors, Nicole and Laura, for all your support and guidance over the past couple months. Any questions, maybe? I don't know what time. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you have 
30 seconds, but we can go a minute. If there's a question, an internal question. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I could answer Barney's really quick because it's short. Um, I think they're predominantly probably one species because Dinophysis acuminata is like the main species and then Mesogenium is like, uh, Mesogenium rubra is the primary like uh, prey species that the Dinophysis acuminata eats. But there, I know there's like a ton of different species of Dinophysis. And there's also two that are really similar. So they just call it like a Dinophysis complex because it's really hard to distinguish between the two. So it's likely that they are different species. Benji, you got a quick one? Um, yeah, I was just wondering how trend, like if, if you think the dynamics in the river system and the embedded area by Bigelow, um, how translatable that is to other river systems along the main coast or yeah, other areas. So that's actually something that would be interesting to do would be compare another river system, maybe like I think it's called the Shepscott River if I'm remembering that right, and maybe look at another embayment area just to see if we're also seeing higher densities in other embayments. And, but I think, I think it is transferable, translatable because I think the river is kind of flushing the organisms more versus the embayment where they're, they're like in a protected little bubble and the water just like goes up and down. Great. Here we go, Alexis. Allegra, you get to load that one up. Okay. Uh, one second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so hello everyone, my name is Leg Rocha and I am a rising junior at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. This summer I was working in the lab of Dr. David Fields, working alongside Dr. Fields and Dr. Abigail Terrell, and the title of my project is An Analysis of the Trends of Phytoplankton Fluorescence Along the Main Coast. And this project and the remote nature of the RU program this summer gave me the opportunity to work with a large set of coastal and gulf data collected by Dr. Fields and to learn how to analyze data in an entirely new way to me using the coding language R with a lot of help from Dr. Terrell. So the focus of this study is phytoplankton, which are incredibly important for a lot of different reasons. Not only are they responsible for the production of over 50% of the world's oxygen production, but they're also primary producers at the very bottom of the aquatic food web. So every consumer in the ocean relies on the presence of phytoplankton for survival. And there was a study conducted using data from the past century that found that phytoplankton populations have actually been in decline, which they suspected to be caused by a rise in sea surface temperatures. So being able to understand how phytoplankton populations change over time is crucial to the health of many of the world's ecosystems. And one of the methods used to measure these changes in phytoplankton over time is fluorescence. And fluorescence is just a measure of the amount of chlorophyll A present in a sample of water. Chlorophyll A, of course, is the pigment found in phytoplankton that allows them to photosynthesize and produce so much of the world's oxygen. So although fluorescence is not a specific count of the number of phytoplankton within a particular sample of water, it can serve as a proxy for phytoplankton biomass that can be tracked over time. And there's a couple of reasons why it's significant that the data in this study was collected in the Gulf of Maine. And the first I want to point out is warming. So on this map, you can see the changes in sea surface temperature in degrees Celsius from 2004, 2004 to 2013. And this small black square here is Gulf of Maine. So from this figure, you can see how the Gulf of Maine is very unique in that its sea surface is warming at a rate faster than nearly anywhere else in the world. This warming can lead to stronger stratification in the water, preventing the phytoplankton from circulating throughout the water column. Not only is sea surface temperature in the Gulf increasing, but so is precipitation. So looking at data collected from the past century, there's been an observed increasing trend in both annual precipitation in Maine, which is here on the x-axis, and the average discharge from the Penobscot River in Maine, which is here on the y-axis. So the increase in precipitation can lead to more nutrient runoff, which can influence the growth of the phytoplankton along the coast and in the Gulf. So it's important to note both of these influences in Maine because they provide a basis as to why there may be any changes in phytoplankton fluorescence trends. The increases in sea surface temperature cause the stronger stratification, which make it more difficult for them to circulate throughout the water. And the high rate of warming experienced in Maine particularly may be able to cause more extreme observations over time. 
and the increase in precipitation causes nutrient runoff that can prevent changes in the conditions along the coast and in the Gulf that are optimal for phytoplankton to grow. As it is, we already observed the emergence of seasonal phytoplankton blooms in the spring and the fall, brought on by these optimal growth conditions. Any changes in the way that these nutrients make their way into the ocean could impact these blooms and the overall growth and reproduction of the phytoplankton. So the primary question of focus for this study is how has the measured phytoplankton fluorescence changed over time along the main coast? Further, any further analysis into this data with the collection of more data in the future could allow for a more in-depth look at correlations to changes in fluorescence, if there are any. For example, we could look at could the rising trends in sea surface temperature or precipitation specifically be influencing fluorescence? So the data that I'm working with was collected at four different sampling sites off the coast and in, in the Gulf of Maine. The first station is upriver of the Damariscotta River. It's about 30 meters in depth. The second station is right off the coast from Bigelow. It's about 20 meters in depth. The third station is at the mouth of an estuary here, about 45 meters in depth. And station four down here is farthest out into the Gulf. It's about 100 meters in depth. So the data was collected from 2012 to 2019, with there being some variation in timing of sampling. Some years or months have more sampling days than others. But for the most part, the bulk of the data was collected during the fall. And the data was collected using this device here. This is the Seabird SBE55 frame eco water sampler. And it was deployed at all four of the stations and reported back measures of depth, water temperature, salinity, density, oxygen saturation, oxygen content, and the one that I'm focusing on is fluorescence as it descended to the floor of each sampling site. And the sampler was equipped with a fluorometer, which is this device here in the middle, that measured the fluorescence at each site. And the fluorometer, it works by emitting a blue light at 470 nanometers, which is the wavelength that chlorophyll A gets excited at. And it measures the amount of emittance at 695 nanometers, which is the wavelength chlorophyll A emits when it gets excited. So I then sorted and analyzed the large data set using R, so it would be easier to isolate fluorescence and produce plots and graphs to determine if there are any trends or possible trends that could be identified. And the results from the project that I'm presenting today are from fall data, so September through November from 2012 to 2019, not including 2014 because for whatever reason there was just no data collected for that year during the fall period. And in particular, I want to call attention to data showing a possible trend in mean fluorescence for one of the stations over time. So this first figure that I want to show is a standard depth profile of the measured fluorescence. And this is data corresponding to station four in fall of 2016. So the measured fluorescence is on the x-axis in milligrams per cubic meter. And the depth is on the y-axis going from zero meters at the surface to about 100 meters, remembering that station four is the deepest station of all the sampling sites. And station, and the red plot is September data, the green plot is October data, and this blue plot is November data. And there's a couple of things that I want to point out from this graph. For one, most of the measured fluorescence appears in the upper water column that's above 30 meters in depth where you can see the water begin to stratify here. And the second thing I want to point out about this figure is that it displays the beginning of the seasonal phytoplankton bloom in September with the depletion of phytoplankton as they're consumed or they die, die off with the change in seasonal temperature by the trend of the fluorescence going down with each successive month of the year. And this trend is not unique to just this station. So this figure here is summarizing the mean fluorescence, which is on the y-axis, again, in milligrams per cubic meter, across each year of sampling for the fall months, so September, October, November. And each box color, of course, represents each of the four sampling sites. And this data is specifically from the surface waters, so up to 30 meters in depth, because that was where most of the fluorescence was measured. And the data that I want to point out specifically and go into more depth on is the mean fluorescence of station two in September. So that's this box here. And I want to focus in on this set of data for a couple of reasons. So here's a closer look at the map I showed earlier, focusing in on station two 
which you can see is right off the coast from Bigelow. And one reason to focus on this station is actually due to the fact that it's right off the coast from Bigelow. So this distance could make it easier to collect future data and it makes it easier to build up data for any one of the particular stations. Station two is also the shallowest of the four sampling sites. So it allows us to focus on the surface depths where most of the fluorescence generally occurs, as we saw in the depth profile from station four. And the seasonal phytoplankton bloom begins in September. So this particular set of data could be of interest to track over time with the compilation of a large data set. In fact, when analyzing the entire data set for every station and month across the eight year span of data collection, station two in the month of September was the set of data that exhibited a possible trend of mean fluorescence from year to year, more than any other combination of station and month. And this figure shows that mean fluorescence at station two during the month of September specifically. The fluorescence is on the Y axis and the X axis shows the progression of time and years as the data were collected. With the amount of data in this data set, a possible trend in the average fluorescence measured at this station during the month of September from year to year can be observed by this trend line. And although these results are not statistically significant, the collection of more data may reveal a more distinct trend in the future. And filling in some of the gaps in data collection to add to this data set opens a lot of opportunity for future research. For example, there was not a lot of data collected during the summer period, and in conjunction with the RU program, if I were able to come back next summer and continue on this project, I'd be able to collect data daily off the coast from Bigelow at station two, and even possibly look at measurements corresponding to tidal changes over the course of several weeks to really build up this data set for the summer. And it would allow a closer look at the changes in fluorescence and may also be interesting to observe with the influence of temperature being greater in the summer and there being a lack of precipitation. And also taking a closer look at the nutrients found at these sampling sites could be another direction to take this research. Looking for more distinct correlation between possible factors influencing fluorescence would benefit the tracking of phytoplankton biomass over time. For example, comparing the measured fluorescence with specific weather patterns that may be influencing the nutrient content along main coast could lead to helpful insight into how the fluorescence might respond to more extreme weather conditions. Even the construction of something like a mesocosm could allow for me to take a closer look at how the fluorescence of phytoplankton can be influenced by changes in weather conditions. And when I began this project, I saw it as an overwhelmingly large set of data. Not that, it, I mean, it absolutely is, but little did I know that it could just be the beginning of a potentially much longer study. <laughs> the RU program being remote this summer was not how I initially expected it to be, but it gave me the opportunity to build my knowledge of data analysis and oceanography while being able to recognize the significance of the findings from all of the studies conducted in the Gulf of Maine. And to close really quickly, I would just like to thank NSF and Bigelow for funding this project. I want to appreciate everyone at Bigelow that helped make this remote RU program possible this summer. I want to thank the field lab. Obviously, David and Abby were the biggest help to me. And also Mara, Molly, and Sam for all of their help and insight in the development and execution of this, of this study. And I want to also acknowledge from my home institution, Dr. Zach Stolschmidt and the Stolschmidt Lab at the University of the Pacific for giving me an introduction into scientific research this past academic year. And thank you all for your time and attention during this presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Fifty-five claps right there. <laughs> um, if there are any questions internally, any other students? I have one actually. Can you hear me well? Sorry, I have my earphones yeah. in. But um, I was wondering if you had any um, hypotheses of what this could potentially mean for uh, the direct uh, predators of phytoplankton, such as zooplankton, and what this. Um, this decrease in phytoplankton and the factors that are affecting them could potentially have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's obviously one of the primary concerns when we're looking at phytoplankton populations and why it's so important to us to track their changes over time because they are the very base of the aquatic food web and any changes in the expected seasonal blooms would affect how zooplankton and 
other consumers that rely on the presence of phytoplankton within a specific time period are going to respond to these changes. So, I mean, looking at any specific, specific hypotheses, there are definitely a lot of them that could be looked at, but with the collection of more data in the future, it would give us a better idea as to how exactly they're changing and how we could respond to them and how other organisms can respond. For sure, thank you. So, uh, Abby asks, great talk. Could increase in fluorescence in September have any implications on the trends in the other months? Yes, absolutely. So, in actually looking at this data set, we did observe a slight decrease in, uh, in fluorescence in October and November, which could suggest that the phytoplankton bloom is coming on stronger in September and ending sooner than we expect. Again, with the collection of more data, as in if we collected data in August, we could see if there is an increasing trend in August, which could suggest that there may be a shift in the timing of the phytoplankton bloom. But of course, the collection of more data is really the path that we would need to take with that. Way to make that plug. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's all yours. All right, can everybody see? We're good? All right, hi everyone. My name is Jess Liu and I'm a rising junior studying biology at Vassar College. And this summer I've been working with Triandis Williams of Truman State University and Dr. John Burns of Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences on the hunt for carnivorous algae and the solar powered organism and, and sea creatures. Or more technically, creating gene-based predictive trophic models for unicellular mixotrophic organisms. That's a much less fun title, but what the heck do I even mean by that? So let's start off by talking about my favorite unicellular organisms, plankton. And this diagram right here is what I like to call the classic dichotomy. And this is something that we're taught to us at a very young age. On one hand, we have phytoplankton. And these are like the teeny tiny microscopic plants of the sea. And just like terrestrial plants, they sit in the sun's rays and use it to turn into sugars, which they use to fuel their uh, cellular processes in a process known as photosynthesis. And on the other hand, we have these little tiny organisms known as protozooplankton. And these are like the teeny tiny little critters of the sea. And much like us, they're heterotrophs, meaning they need to eat in order to live. And they use a special process known as phagocytosis in order to capture, kill, and engulf their prey. And under this classic dichotomy, one usually eats the other. And these organisms have huge impacts on ecology and human life. For one, they form the base of nearly every aquatic food web. They feed organisms as small as baby fish, all the way up to organisms as large as whale sharks. And additionally, they cause really, um, they cause ecological phenomena such as red tides and plankton blooms, which can either be horribly detrimental or immensely helpful to ocean life and the humans that um, thrive off of them. And if you don't care about either of these aspects, then, you sh then I'm sure you care about breathing and being alive because these organisms create nearly 70% of the Earth's oxygen. So if you're concerned about living, you should be concerned about plankton research. And we should be especially concerned about how wrong we've been over these past few decades. What I've enumerated in the first slide as the classic dichotomy is actually wrong. What scientists now understand is that many planktonic protist organisms express or have the potential to express both photosynthesis and phagocytosis. And this separate process is known as mixotrophy. And because scientists are very, very creative in naming things, they've coined the plankton that engaged in mixotrophy as mixoplankton. And this is pretty groundbreaking. It would be as if your houseplants were actually eating your dinner this entire time and you didn't even realize until yesterday. As significant as this is, we actually currently don't know how many mixoplankton or what the distribution of mixoplankton across our Earth's oxygen, uh, our, across our Earth's oceans are right now. 
And for many reasons. For one, it's hard to know which plankton are capable of mixotrophy because they're really hard to observe. They're teeny tiny little microscopic organisms. And so you can't just look off the ocean and be like, ah, yes, mixotrophic plankton over there doing some mixotrophy. No, you have to grow and culture them in a lab. Now, unfortunately, many of these organisms are actually really hard to grow and don't survive the culturing process in um, most labs. And if they do survive, the behavior that they engage in might not necessarily be representative of how they would act in an ocean environment. An ocean has lots of uncontrolled variables that us humans don't even fully understand, while a lab is very sterile and very uncontrollable, or very um, controlled, rather. So, we have to turn to another tool, which thankfully for this year's REU program requires no in-person wet lab research. And that is something known as gene-based predictive models. Another mouthful of science jargon, I know, but it's actually quite simple if we break it down into its parts. The first step of making a gene-based predictive model is to identify core proteins that are required for a specific trophic mode that aren't found in any other trophic modes. So for example, there are certain proteins in genes that are found in photosynthetic organisms that aren't found in any other type of organism. And the same is true for phag phagocytotic organisms. So that's kind of how our current model works. And all you really need in order to run our current model, which came out in 2017, is proteins. Not those kinds of proteins, these kinds of proteins. And thanks to the central dogma of biology, you can either start off with a genome or a transcriptome uh, sequence. As long as you can eventually translate those into proteins, you can put them into our computer. And it goes into our model using some magical computer science processes and it starts running and it does some algorithmic stuff and some amazing stuff happens and then it explodes. No, it doesn't explode. But basically what it's doing is it's operating off of these categories, phagotrophy, photosynthesis, and biosynthesis. It's created those groups prior and now or I should mention that biosynthesis is a separate pathway that we would expect most autotrophic life to have. It basically means that this organism doesn't need to eat in order to um, survive. It can make all of the biomolecules required for its life. Um, so what we do is we take any organism that we'd like. I'm representing it here by this little cloud right here. We can call him Steve. And Steve has all of these genes. And what this model does is it takes Steve's genes and it categorizes them into these specific groups. By looking at this particular distribution of genes, I could see that it has a pretty good um, even split between um, genes that are required for phagotrophy and those that would be expected for a photoautotroph. So I would classify Steve as a mixotroph because he has all of the biological machinery required for both of those processes. And this classification tool is great at this. It can classify single organisms all day, every day. But what if I want to run it on a metagenomic sample? It gets a little more complicated. What do I mean by a metagenomic sample? I like to think of it as a glass of water. So if I took a glass and I dipped it in any body of water all around the world, it would be filled with these tiny unicellular plankton. Would I be able to give an estimate of how many phagotrophs photoautotrophs and mixotrophs there are in this glass? Let's find out. So once again, we're operating off of the same three categories, phagotrophy, photosynthesis, and biosynthesis. And now we're gonna dip our little glass of water into a larger body of water that is composed of only phagoheterotrophs and photoautotrophs, little to my knowledge. And I do all of the processing necessary in order to run it in this current model. And what it does, it's going to categorize those genes just like it would on a single species. And it creates this beautiful distribution. And as you can see, there's like that 50-50 split once again of genes for phagotrophy versus genes for photoautotrophy. So I would look at this distribution and I would say, wow, that's probably a 50-50 split of phagoheterotrophs and photoautotrophs. That's great and fine and dandy. But what if we wanted to take a second glass of water and little to my knowledge, this glass of water contained only phagomixotrophs. So we do that same processing of our data before we run the model. 
and then the model would categorize those genes. And here what we can see is an extraordinarily similar distribution to the former one that we ran with only phagoheterotrophs and photoautotrophs. And by looking at this data, I would still quantify it probably as a 50-50 split of phagoheterotrophs and photoautotrophs, but we know that's not true based on what I've told you about this glass of water. So, hence the need for a new mixotroph model. We had to go back to the drawing board in step one and identify core proteins that are required for mixotrophy this time. And that's exactly what we did. We fed our model two completely different groups of organisms. Group one consisted of 14 mixotrophs, all of which were um, independently evolved. They're very diverse all across the tree of life. They included organisms such as dinoflagellates, green algae, rhizarians, and each one of these has been lab confirmed to be a mixotroph. In our second group, we included 29 known non-mixotroph eukaryotes. Once again, very diverse all across the tree of life. Organisms that are unicellular, multicellular, including plants, fungi, animals, other protists. And we wanted to see if the model could identify proteins and genes that are found in group one, but not in group two. And so when we ran the model, this is what, we gave, this is what it gave us. A wall of paint swatches. I'm just kidding. Um, this is actually a heat map that uses a spectrum of color to show how many genes are present and absent in an organism. So along the x-axis here, we have the various organisms. I haven't listed them because the text is very, very small. And along the y-axis is those particular genes. The bluer a square is, the more genes that that organism has belonging to that specific category. And the redder a square is, the fewer. And what we can see here with our mixotrophs outlined in our white rectangle is that there are genes and proteins present in mixotrophs that are not found in non-mixotrophs. And this is pretty amazing because it may indicate that mixotrophy occurred in these very diverse organisms as the result of convergent evolution. Just like how both bats and birds both have wings to fly, but they're very distantly related. So this means that we can make a mixotroph model, and that's exactly what we did. So going back to our hypothetical um, situation in which we're taking glasses of water and metagenomic samples, we're working with the same three categories as before, but this time we're adding a fourth, mixotrophy. Let's get back to our glasses of water. So we have our phagoheterotrophs and photoautotrophs. Once again, we do all the necessary processing and the genes get sorted into categories. Now we can see it's a pretty similar distribution as the former model. Like it, the mixotroph category might have caught a few genes as the result of chance or just the genes that, are, that happen to be present in that organism. And I would still look at this and give you a rough estimate of a 50-50 split between phagoheterotrophs and photoautotrophs in this particular glass of water. Now let's run it again with our phago mixotroph sample. And what we can see is that due to the new category, it actually catches much more of these mixotroph genes. And there is all of this other noise, but once I am able to sort all of that out, I can very clearly say that this sample is composed of mostly phago mixotrophs. I should also mention that our new model can also perform classifications of individual species, but I won't get into that right now unless someone really wants me to at the end. So let's go over what I found this summer. There is a common set of mixotroph proteins that are not found in any other organism. And this may indicate convergent evolution of that trait. Now, the model still has a lot of fine tuning to do, but it may eventually be able to resolve the ambiguity from the former model and allow for better quantification of trophic composition of any mixed DNA sample. Meaning, someday in the near future, I could ask all of you to go out and fetch me a glass of water from any body of water in the world. And I could tell you the trophic composition of all of those organisms in that glass. And that's actually what some scientists have already done aboard the Terra Ocean ship, which has sailed across the entire world collecting little glasses of water, and we will assess them very soon. So one day we could know just how many mixotrophs there are in our oceans.
And with that, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding this uh, project and making it all possible. I'd like to thank Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, especially Dr. David Fields, Dr. Nicole Poulton for putting this all together. I'd like to thank our REU interns for always giving me something to look forward to and smile about. And a very, very special shout out to our IT team for helping me after I deleted my computer. I wish I was joking about that. Um, I'd also extend my thanks to Vassar College, my home institution, and, and especially my advisor, Dr. Meg Rontheim, for her continued support. And finally, I'd like to thank Dr. John Burns, my mentor who made all of this research possible, who answered my emails even at weird hours of the morning. Dr. Baptiste Janot, who sat in and learned how to code with us, even though he had a lot of other important things to do, I'm sure. And Triandis Williams, my lovely lab partner who patiently sat with me and helped me sort out all of the horrors and wonders of coding. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you guys might have. Any from the students that you have any questions? I'm going to the floor, Jess. So what are some, some of the mixotroph specific proteins and genes? Right, I would love to be able to answer that question. Um, however, the, there's a lot of limitations in being able to see exactly what those proteins are due to limitations in our um, gene annotation abilities right now. So it, it could tell you what genes are present, but it might not give you the best function um, and so I've, I've been having a very hard time find, uh, linking those specific genes back to um, the proteins and the functions that they fall under. But hopefully very soon, I will be able to actually answer that question. How long does it take to process a sample? Do you pull out a, a thing of water? I mean, is this something that happens on the fly or is this no, not necessarily. There's an entirely separate wet lab procedure that I'm not well versed in, but it does require DNA extraction and barcoding and all of that fun stuff. So um, I didn't get to do any of that, but I imagine that thanks to current advances in DNA technology, all of that process probably wouldn't take longer than a few days up to a week. Other thoughts? All right, we're loading, ready to go, Jess. Thank you. Emily, you're loading up. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Cunningham, and I'm a senior environmental science major at Colby College. This summer, I had the absolute privilege to work with Dr. Nicole Price and collaborate with Dr. Pete Edmonds to conduct a meta-analysis of global trends in the biogeography of coral recruitment. So climate change is causing coral reefs to be increasingly threatened by large-scale disturbances such as rising carbon dioxide levels, intensifying storms, and acidifying surface waters. And all of these events lead to higher rates of coral mortality, which contributes to a global decline in coral density, such as in the top right photo here where you can see a coral recruit severely damaged by ocean acidification. But today I want to focus on the threat of heat stress, as persistent heat waves can cause mass coral bleaching events. Coral bleaching occurs when the increase in water temperature stresses coral out, causing them to expel their tiny plant-like organisms that live in their tissues, zooxanthellae, which provide coral with essential nutrients and their bright color. In the bottom right here, you can see what a healthy coral looks like versus what a bleached coral looks like and how drastic the difference is. One of the key mechanisms that determines the recovery of a reef post disturbance is coral recruitment, which is when coral recruits settle and establish themselves on the reef. And while corals can produce both asexually and sexually, sexual reproduction is actually the only means through which decimated coral colonies can be rejuvenated, either by quickly reestablishing a once thriving reef with new recruits or through building colonies outside of their original range. So last year, Dr. Price and her colleagues discovered that since the 1970s and up to 2014, corals have been recruiting at slower rates in the tropics and establishing new reefs in the subtropics. But in the last 20 years, we have seen some of the worst heat waves yet, 
And this figure here shows the global average mean heat wave frequency, intensity, duration, and sea surface temperature over time, which you can see all have increased since 2000. And in turn, these heat waves have caused some of the worst, worst bleaching events ever seen as well. In 2015 and 2016, um, more than 75% of Earth's tropical reefs experienced bleaching level heat stress as depicted by uh, these red areas here on the map and then also by the white circles that depict severe bleaching events. So not only has there been this increase in bleaching events, but there's also been an increased interest in conducting coral recruitment studies that can be seen in this figure with time on the x-axis and the number of published coral recruitment papers on the y-axis. And we can see this increase, especially from 2000 onwards, um, following the major El Nino event in 1998, and then again in 2015, which is significant as El Ninos cause water temperature to increase and can lead to coral bleaching. So corals have two sexual reproduction strategies, spawning and brooding. Spawning, um, an incredible mechanism shown in this video, occurs when gametes are released in synchronized annual mass spawning events. Fertilized embryos develop into coral larvae um, while in the water column for several weeks before settling on the reef. And brooding corals release fully formed larvae that are already mature enough to settle, usually on a lunar cycle. And then in this video, you can see um, coral larvae um, sniffing out coralline crustose algae, um, attaching, and then starting to secrete their calcium carbonate skeleton. And um, factors like light, orientation, and the detection of settlement cues can all influence where a coral recruit decides to settle. So we know what recruitment is, but how do we measure it? Settlement um, plates are increasingly being used as a method to do this because of their low cost, low impact, and replicable nature. And they simulate natural substrates that corals settle on to determine coral colony density. And the bottom right photo here is an example of what these look like. So these plates are immersed underwater for a period of time, usually just before um, spawning events, and then the plates are removed and the coral recruits like this one, are counted under magnification to find the density of coral recruit colonies. And this is often used as a proxy for recruitment success because their abundance and spatial distribution represent the cumulative outcome from the reproductive process. So that's why mean recruit density per meter squared is a metric that will be used to measure coral recruitment. So the aim of the study is to expand a global database of reports of coral recruits on settlement plates, and then also to answer the question, is there any evidence that biogeographical trends in coral recruitment identified from the last century are upheld in a time of unprecedented coral bleaching? So first I hypothesized that the latitudes where coral recruit densities are highest have shifted polewards, and secondly, that over time, coral recruit densities have declined in the tropics and increased in the subtropics. So to study this, I first compiled a list of papers that were all published from 2014 to 2020 uh, in Mendeley that described studies where coral settlement tiles have been immersed in a shallow reef habitat to track coral recruitment by measuring density. Uh, for a paper to qualify, it also must be a field study and have no experimental manipulation except for the pre-seasoning of plates. And I use Google Scholar, Scopus, and the database BicoDemo to identify papers using variations of the search terms coral settlement tiles. After identifying these papers, I then use the data extraction software Webplot Digitizer to manually extract the data from the figures. So for example, this figure here is a graph from the paper Bauman et al. 2014 that I inserted into Webplot Digitizer to extract the mean recruitment per plate that I then converted to density per meter squared by pinpointing where the bars on the graph stopped. And I also identified about 30 different metadata for each paper that I entered into a master database, also used in the Price et al. study, the most important being mean density value and then also the GPS coordinates. So the first goal of the project was to continue to compile data for the master database. So by the end, I collected data from 40 new studies, which led to 910 unique coral densities from 153 sites being added to the database, which you can see highlighted in this global map of study sites used at creating ArcGIS with the orange dots uh, representing site sample from 1970 to 1999, and blue dots representing the new site sample from 2000 to 2019. And uh, 
this is super exciting because this doubled the master database in just three short weeks. So we first analyzed the spatial distribution of coral densities um, from, 19, from the 1970s to 2019 with latitude on the x-axis and then coral density on the y-axis. And we chose to split the data up into two temporal categories, um, 1970 uh, to 1999, uh, represented by the orange bars, and then 2000 to 2019, represented by the blue bars. Uh, firstly, because 2000 is a midpoint for the time series, and then secondly, because 2000 is right after one of the most severe El Nino events to be recorded at the time. And then here, the dashed lines represents a five degree latitude running average. And in terms of trends in peak recruitment, which are indicated by the arrows, the mean recruitment latitude for peak coral recruitment for 1970 to 1999 is 15 degrees. And then after 2000, peak recruitment shifted away from the equator to greater than 20 degrees latitude, with spikes even occurring as high as 30 degrees latitude. So therefore, hypothesis one is supported as there is a poleward latitude shift in peak coral recruitment density in the latter set of years. However, it is important to note that um, peak recruitment at 15 degrees from the 1970 to 1999 period is a conservative estimate because you would expect peak coral recruitment to be closer to the equator where coral densities are the highest. And the reason that it's not isn't because there wasn't more recruitment near the equator back then, but it's because we weren't looking for coral recruitment near the equator. So the lack of uh, equatorial studies in the 1970s and 80s can be seen on this graph here that depicts the number of coral recruitment studies per latitude per year. Um, as you can see, there's only one study from 0 to 10 degrees latitude in the 1970s and only two studies from 0 to 10 degrees latitude in the 1980s compared to 2010 where you can see 150 studies right at 0 degrees latitude, 180 studies at 5 degrees latitude, and so on. So if more research had been conducted in uh, the Coral Triangle during early coral reef research, a more dramatic latitudinal shift probably would have been observed over time. And the previous graph therefore underpredicts a decrease in coral recruitment over these four decades. So shifting gears to address hypothesis two and recognizing the paucity of data in earlier decades, uh, next we explore temporal trends in coral recruitment density in both the tropics and the subtropics with years on the x-axis and the density of coral recruits on the y-axis. Uh, the Price 2019 study found that using a 20 degrees latitude inflection point is appropriate to separate the tropics from the subtropics. So we continued on with that analysis by separately exploring temporal trends at sites below 20 degrees latitude. And the majority of the new data were added through 2005 to 2020. And uh, the data show that in the tropics, recruit densities have decreased over time, especially after this last big El Nino event here in 2015. And the original trend of increasing recruitment at higher latitudes has halted. So here we see the same graph with the addition of recruits above 20 degrees latitude um, depicted by the blue dots. And you can see that there are some very high settlement numbers, which all come from a study in the Hawaiian Islands at 32 degrees latitude. And this could really skew the data, but it only represents low influence on the entire data set because it was just a handful of tiles in a small subset of sites. So here we see this is the same graph with those outliers removed, and you can see that there is a general trend over time in coral recruitment severely declining below 20 degrees latitude in the tropics and coral recruitment increasing above 20 degrees latitude in the subtropics. And in both the tropics and the subtropics, recruitment rates are consistently very low, remaining below 160 individuals per meter squared after 2015, when this large El Nino event occurred. And this number is very small compared to the numbers that we see in thousands in the early 90s and then also in the early 2000s. And um, therefore, hypothesis two was only somewhat supported as coral recruit densities have declined in the tropics over time, but they've also declined in the subtropics over time. So in conclusion, generally our hypotheses were supported, but recruit densities have not continued to grow in the subtropics as we expected besides the occasional spike. And um, this likely can be explained by the catastrophic heat waves that have occurred in the last 10 years, especially from 2014 to 2017, where we saw unprecedented coral bleaching on a global scale. And therefore, 
it is currently ambiguous whether subtropical refugia will be adequate to rescue coral reefs and future research will be needed to determine if this is actually the case. Um, so for the next steps of this project include to continue to compile the global database. And then the second step is corals can be pretty difficult to identify down to a genus or species level. Um, so we hope to investigate if coral recruitment is consistent across reproductive strategy. And finally, to conduct field work in un unstudied sites by measuring coral recruit densities to make the global database more complete. And so gaining a better understanding of biogeographic trends in coral recruitment during this intensifying warming period will really provide better insight into what extent sexual reproduction has continued to aid coral recovery and understand if and how reefs can be recolonized by hard corals. And so with that, um, I would just like to thank um, the support and funding provided by the NSF for the Bigelow Laboratory REU program, David Fields and Roxana Branch for putting together this extraordinary opportunity. Um, of course, my mentor, Dr. Nicole Price, who was um, an amazing mentor, um, my home institution, Colby College, the numerous authors who provided their data for this project, and just the incredible staff at Bigelow Laboratory. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that people may have. <laughs> Uh, there are about two minutes, two and a half minutes. So if there are internal questions, shoot away. Okay, I got one. David. <laughs> so uh, do corals, uh, do they spawn at a particular time of the year? And is that controlled for in some of the papers that you look for? And as a Secondary question to that. Um, I'm wondering if not only is there a latitudinal shift, but are they shifting to spawning later so that it's cooler or some aspect of that? Is there any indication of that? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, it definitely depends on the species of coral and also just where it's located. So one of the metadata that we collect from the papers is actually the local time of spawning. Um, so a lot of times it, I've noticed that it's tended to be like in March and April, um, but that also could just be coincidental. Um, so I guess that would be something that would be really interesting to look at because we do have all of that data. So that would definitely be great for future analysis. Um, are the latitudes on the bottom there both south and north? I mean, do you? Oh yeah, it was it was absolute value. Of absolute. Yep. That was a great talk. You gave a really great talk. Thank you. I have a question. Dylan, uh, would you mind speaking a bit about uh, what's being done? Like, what efforts are put forth to help restore these corals in light of the heat waves? Yeah. Um, so I know one coral restoration strategy uh, that's used to promote natural recovery is actually growing corals on like a very large scale and replanting them on the reef. So that involves a method called fragmentation, which is taking living pieces of coral and then cutting them into very small pieces. And this micro fragmentation actually helps speed up the rate um, of coral growth. So that's one thing. And then I also believe that I read a study that um, certain scientists are like collecting coral that spawn um, from different spawning events and then they're growing it in a tank in a lab and then depositing it back into the ocean onto damaged reefs and that's been successful. Wow, what an extensive effort. That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, your time is done but there are some uh, questions that come in and I'll send you that transcript so you can just look over it. Thank you. Great. Thanks Emily. Um, Taylor. Ooh, right. Sorry. <laughs> the the post-talk applause. Uh, you might want to say something because I don't know if you're muted or not. Sorry, I was I was definitely muted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am Taylor Rouse. I am a student from Iowa State University studying environmental science and data science. I will be a senior this coming year. Um, and this summer I have been working with Dr. Katherine Mitchell from Bigelow Laboratories um, on our project of evaluating the performance of standard ocean color algorithms, sorry, in the Gulf of Maine. 
So starting with a little bit of background, um, our oceans play a vital role in the global carbon, global carbon cycle. And because there has been a very significant increase in atmospheric carbon due to anthropogenic emissions, there is also an increase in aquatic uptake of CO2. And this increase in the CO2 creates a corresponding increase in ocean acidity. Um, this will have a direct and has had a direct impact on ocean calcifers, some including uh, marine snails, shellfish, crustaceans, um, such as shrimp and lobsters, starfish, um, sea urchins, and other echinoderms. Even the photosynthetic algae um, that we will talk about a little bit later um, called coccolithophores, which there's a small picture of here, um, encase themselves in calcium carbonate platelets. Increasing the acidification has an overall effect on the productivity, abundance, and distribution of various marine plants, fish, and invertebrates. And this change is very socially and economically important because many communities do rely on sustainable coastal ecosystems to support their fisheries and aquaculture. And therefore, we have a very high need for a reliable way to quantify and predict the drivers of this aquatic carbon and how changes will impact ecosystems that are dependent upon this production. And on a large scale, this has been done using satellite ocean technology, which is where our project comes in. So as a larger part of the effort to evaluate performance of standard ocean color algorithms measuring the different forms of carbon in the Gulf of Maine, I evaluated algorithms specifically for particulate inorganic carbon or PIC. And I evaluated the standard NASA PIC algorithm, which uses a combination of a lookup table and the backscattering of light um, to calculate the PIC. And then I also evaluated the new model created by Catherine Mitchell and Barney Volch back in 2017, which specifically uses the backscattering of those coccolithophores to calculate PIC. And I will refer to this algorithm as the CI algorithm. As you can see in this image here, this is actually a depiction of one of the satellites that is being used to take these satellite images all over the world. And this is kind of what one of those large scale images might look like. And I believe this one is showing us the chlorophyll content um, in the ocean. So to evaluate these algorithms, I created a matchup data set which spans the last 20 years with measurements directly from the Gulf of Maine. The field data I used comes from the Gulf of Maine North Atlantic time series known as NATS, which has nothing to do with insects, thankfully, and everything to do with collecting a range of biological, biochemical, optical, hydrographic measurements um, between Portland, Maine and Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. So the longevity of this program has really allowed for the study of these chemical and biological variabilities over time and the development of these remote sensing options um, that we're looking at. So in these photos, you can see Barney right here um, with a Colby alum setting up instruments that actually are measuring the light and water color, as well as the small portable lab used um, through the, throughout the program. To get a better understanding of where and what I'm looking at, this figure here shows you a single satellite file um, using the standard PIC algorithm, which you can see um, the variability in color down here. Um, and then I overlaid the NATS transect um, across this in the Gulf of Maine. And some of these images that I've been looking at um, can be very honestly beautiful and especially useful when tracking and understanding how carbon is changing. And so our real objection here was to use this matchup data set to compare field measurements to the satellite observations. And to get an even closer look at the satellite file, you can see that it is very pixelated, um, but that's for a reason, as every pixel um, we are seeing in here is one kilometer by one kilometer. Um, and 
here each color you are seeing in these boxes um, is an average of the PIC concentration over the area. The white spaces um, is where we're not getting the reflection needed to calculate PIC, which is usually because um, of a cloud or something covering the area um, that's not allowing the light to get through. And each pixel actually holds an array of data which we are using to compare, or which we use to compare to the NATS field data. And to do this, I calculated the distance between the field latitude and longitude pair um, and the latitude longitude pair within each satellite file, which was quite a lot. Um, and using the smallest distance between them to match specific pixels to the NATS measurements. Um, which did take the majority of my time this summer, but thankfully learning more about programs, um, especially in Python, uh, made this very rewarding. And so our goal here was to decide whether or not each specific matchup has a small enough error to accept the algorithm is actually doing its job well enough. So to begin the actual evaluation, I first got a look into the ratio of each algorithm and the field data. So as you can he see here on both of these Y axes, um, I plotted the satellite PIC over the measured NATS PIC um, and then used the log of the measured PIC for the X axis um, with the standard algorithm over here in blue and the CI right here in green. And this gives us a look at the ratio over all the points and shows us what looks like quite a bit of variation. Um, but looking at these images, it made us wonder if there is just a massive number of points within this kind of solid cloud um, towards these values. And we just can't see it from here. And so to test that, we decided to plot the ratios as a histogram. And as you can see here, with the original standard algorithm in blue and the CI values in green, um, when plotting the ratios as a histogram, you can really see what is happening at the lower end of the PIC scale in a less complicated and more easily understandable way. And here we see that there is a greater amount of values that are closer to the lower end for both algorithms but it's not exactly what we were hoping or what we expected to see. Um, so what we wanted to see was a lot more values centered around this ratio of one, um, especially within this 25% um, area around one, which is where these dashed lines are, um, which would mean that the satellite calculations and the measured PIC data is about the same value. Um, and also what we did see was this big spike um, in the values for the original algorithm, very close to zero, um, which is because the standard algorithm has a certain threshold for values that do not seem actually possible. Um, and therefore the value is then recorded at this low threshold, which affects the ratio of the entire algorithm um, for those specific points. And what the CI algorithm currently does not do this and will actually record some negative values. So this gave us the results showing that for the original algorithm, only about 15% of the matchups were within that 25% range around the field, field data and an even lower amount of 10% of the matchups for the CI algorithm were within 25% of that field data. So to make sure my ratios are actually making sense, uh, I created this box plot to show the distribution of the different PIC values. Um, and it does show that my ratios are consistent, which is encouraging, encouraging for my work, um, but not so much for the CI algorithm, um, which is shown here. And I also took a look at the bias and the mean squared error for both algorithms. And as you can see, um, their bias is a lot different with the bias of the standard algorithm only being about 0 0.9 and the CI algorithm being 2.76. Um, and, and then the mean squared errors were about the same. Um, 
So our next question was, why is the CI algorithm not doing so well? Um, and to make the CI algorithm, they actually used a global data set. Um, the Gulf of Maine only makes up a very small part of that. And because um, the CI algorithm is empirical, it only is defined by the data given to it. And if we solely want to look at the Gulf of Maine, which you can see here in this lovely picture, um, and possibly even other coastal areas, it needs to be specifically redefined. In the global ocean, the backscattering comes from those coccolithophores, but in coastal waters, it, it can come from other sources contributing to backscattering, such as runoff, which you can actually see a bit of this change um, right along the coast here. Um, and so the standard algorithm works a little bit better because it uses a lot of predetermined situations and is a bit more complex on that case. Um, but something is going on in the Gulf of Maine that both of these algorithms are just not catching. Therefore, from our results, it looks like the algorithm, the CI algorithm, which we are working on, does need to be refined. And we plan to hopefully derive new coefficients for the algorithm by performing a least squared fit through half of the NATS data and going back through the algorithm evaluation on the other half. So we have sort of this circular um, method going on here. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their time. I want to specifically acknowledge my mentor, Catherine Mitchell, for all of her help over the summer, especially working with Python, as I don't have a lot of experience with that um, program, as well as the entire Balch Lab um, and those who worked with the NATS campaign. I want to thank everyone at Bigelow, especially David Fields and the other REU students um, for not only the help with all my research, but also the moral support and the many laughs. Um, a big thanks to the National Science Foundation um, for funding the REU program and the support of NASA's Carbon Monitoring System program, who, who, was the fun who gave the funding for, for um, Catherine's projects um, on the satellites. And I also want to shout out my mom and my family who have been um, continuously supportive of all my aspirations. So with that, I would like to ask if anyone has any questions. Nice job. There are a couple of minutes. If there are an okay. internal one. I have a quick question, if that's okay. Um, if I understood you correctly, you said that the CI algorithm can sometimes give negative numbers. And I was wondering like how that's possible, I guess, because it wouldn't really happen in the ocean, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, so the CI algorithm um, returns these negative values because it's an imperial algorithm, which I kind of talked about, um, and works on the specific spectral shape, if I'm correct on that. And there might be something in the water um, that gives us a number that the algorithm has absolutely no experience with, um, then it would possibly calculate a negative number. Um, but in the next version of the CI algorithm, um, I actually heard that they're doing something to catch this. And instead of recoding those numbers um, at that low threshold, um, like the standard algorithm is already doing, they're just gonna record it as a non-value, so it won't affect that ratio that I was working with at all, which would be really nice. Yeah. So Anne asks, any idea what's causing the difference in the Gulf of Maine that could prevent your models from working? Are there differences in nutrients, the types of living things, or is there something else that you think of? Yeah, so it could be a combination of all of that. Like I said, a lot of what's going on in the coast is different just because there's runoff from rivers um, and maybe pollutants that are causing this reflection of light. Um, whereas in the open ocean, it's pretty much specifically phytoplankton chlorophyll um, and these coccolithophores that we're looking at. Um, and the CI algorithm especially only is looking at the coccolithophores and the other, our standard algorithm, um, just doesn't have enough uh, 
information in those lookup tables to like code for that, I guess. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have one really short question, maybe. Do you know how deep the uh, satellite can see down into the water column? Um, <laughs> off the top of my head, I do not. Um, I, I know that I've read papers where they're working on making it look deeper. Um, but off the top of my head, I just can't remember what the exact depth is from those satellites. But yeah, I, I wonder if from it, the surface or like close, very close to the surface. Yeah, I was wondering if increased chlorophyll at the surface could be blocking some of that PIC signals. And so you're yeah. getting lower ones than Barney would actually get in his measurements. Yeah, that could be a possibility too. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. <laughs> And winding this thing up. Liz, are you there? Let me see where I'm here. Okay. All load, right, here we go. Load yourself up. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being here today. My name is Elizabeth, and I'm a rising third year undergraduate student studying biochemistry at the University of Maryland in College Park. So this summer, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Chris Apley and Dr. Brian Demento on their project investigating the photodegradation of short-chain chlorinated paraffins. And you might be asking yourself, what exactly is a short-chain chlorinated paraffin? Well, as you can see from this example I have on the slide, they're actually very simple molecules, which just consist of a carbon chain, 10 to 13 carbons in length, and chlorine substituents, which make up 30 to 70% of the molecule by mass. Historically, they've been used since around the 1930s, primarily as industrial metalworking lubricants, but along with medium and long-chain chlorinated paraffins, they've also got some more commonplace uses, such as paint additives, plasticizers, and flame retardants. Their worldwide production was relatively unregulated until they were officially declared a persistent organic pollutant in 2017 by the United Nations Environment Program. This classification came about due to the molecule's toxicity, their ability to bioaccumulate, and their inability to degrade quickly in the environment. Unfortunately, while many countries have since banned their production, there are still several countries around the world that are producing them, and there are reserves of them all over the place that have yet to be released into the environment. So, the study of these molecules is still extremely relevant today, even though they've undergone some significant increases in regulation the past couple of years. So not a whole lot is known about the fate of these pollutants in the environment. And the goal of our project is to better understand how long they will persist and how they will eventually break down. These molecules don't show any evidence of breaking down by direct sunlight or by microbes. So instead, we believe that they degrade by a more indirect pathway, wherein sunlight causes these massive molecules, known as dissolved organic matter, to produce a very reactive radical species called hydrated electrons. Hydrated electrons show evidence of being able to break down SECPs by dechlorination, which is great, but there's a major problem here. The hydrated electrons are encapsulated in these dissolved organic matter molecules, and if they leave, they will almost immediately be used up by other species in the aquatic environment. They would likely never come in contact with an SCCP or any other chlorinated pollutant for that matter. So this is where the properties of dissolved organic matter become very important. As you can see from this proposed structure of a dissolved organic matter molecule I have on this slide, they are extremely complicated molecules, and they have a variety of interesting properties but the most important thing to understand about them for this particular project is that they are typically so large they actually can create their own little hydrophobic microenvironment, wherein these smaller hydrophobic molecules like SCCPs can accumulate and have an opportunity to degrade. This is why it's thought that the ability of any molecule to degrade by this pathway is contingent on that molecule's affinity for the so-called DOM phase that's created by dissolved organic matter. This contingency has actually been shown by other researchers studying this pathway, including Dr. Amanda M. Granis et al. in 2012. This figure from that paper shows that hexachlorobenzene, which has a relatively high affinity for dissolved organic matter, is able to degrade in solutions where dissolved organic matter is present, um, but not really able to degrade when dissolved organic matter is not present. Meanwhile, lindane, which has little to no affinity for DOM, um, doesn't really degrade whether dissolved organic matter is present or not. So this again suggests that the ability of any molecule to degrade by this particular pathway is highly contingent on 
um, that molecule's affinity for dissolved organic matter, which is why I studied the affinity of short-chain chlorinated paraffins for DOM this summer. The goals of my project were to first develop a method to predict the affinity for, of a variety of SCCPs for DOM, and then use that method to identify some specific structural characteristics that might make certain SCCPs more likely to be able to degrade by this pathway, under, again, this assumption that affinity for DOM leads to increased degradation. I did this using computational methods, and here's why. Here are three more examples of some short-chain coordinated paraffin molecules. And again, they're very simple, but their analysis has always been complicated by the fact that these are just three out of over 4,000 different molecules that technically qualify as short-chain coordinated paraffins. So it would take quite unreasonable amounts of time, effort, and resources to experimentally determine all of these individual affinities. Computational methods were much more practical, and my computational project was made possible by two very important things. Number one was the software suite that I used, which is called CosmoLogic. This consists of two programs called CosmoConf and CosmoTherm. CosmoConf um, was responsible for calculating these molecular geometries of all of the molecules I used in calculations done in simulations, um, while CosmoTherm was responsible for using these calculated molecular geometries to calculate what's called a partitioning coefficient for some of these molecules. The idea behind a partitioning coefficient is that if I take a molecule like hexachlorobenzene and throw it into a solution containing a hydrophobic substance like DOM or octanol and an aqueous substance, which is just water, then um, some of that hexachlorobenzene or HCV is going to go into this hydrophobic substance and some of it's going to stay in the aqueous phase. The partitioning coefficient is calculated by dividing the concentration of the analyte, which again is HCV in this case, um, in the hydrophobic substance by the concentration of the analyte that stays in the water. So here are two formulas for important partitioning coefficients I used in my project, the octanol water partitioning coefficient, KOW, and the DOM water partitioning coefficient, KDOM. And the second thing that made this project possible was actually the relationship that exists between these two values. So a good portion of my work this summer consisted of a massive literature search for experimentally determined log KDUM values for molecules that are similar to SCCPs but are much more thoroughly studied. So we actually have literature values for these things. And this was in order to determine the most accurate method of predicting DUM partitioning coefficients. So after experimenting with several different ways of representing DOM in the computer, I found that log KDUM could most accurately be extrapolated from simple log KOW values um, that were calculated using CosmoTherm, and that's shown by this linear correlation here in blue. The competing method that you see in orange is calculating log KDOM values directly using these representative DOM molecules, which were designed to behave like DOM in computer simulations, but um, they weren't designed in the context of partitioning, which is why you get these major inaccuracies, and um, this correlation ends up being weaker than the correlation that exists with calculated log KW values. So in conclusion, moving forward, the most trusted method of calculating log KDOM was extrapolation from log KOW values that were calculated using CosmoTherm. As far as the accuracy of CosmoTherm goes, you can see from this plot comparing experimental log KOW values to calculated log KOW values that the software does a really, really great job at matching experimental values with its predictions, which is just really amazing. But even so, it should always be noted that, of course, these are just predictions based on calculations. And they're not always perfectly accurate, but they are pretty, pretty spot on for, um, for a computer simulation. So now I'm going to show you three plots in total that contain calculated log KW values for a variety of SCCPs. In each one, the X and Y axis are giving information about the number of carbons and chlorines in the molecule, and the symbols that you see representing each molecule are giving you information about the distribution of the chlorine substituents for each specific isomer. So this first plot shows log KDOM values calculated using that linear extrapolation from log KW values that I explained before. Um, these log KW data that were used to extrapolate these values were borrowed from Dr. Julianne Kluge et al, who calculated some basic, basic physiochemical properties for SCCPs in 2013 using CosmoTherm. 
So because of the way that they methodically chose which isomers to calculate values for, you can see the patterns and trends really clearly in their data. And as expected, when the carbon chain length is increasing, um, you also see an increase in log KIW values. And for molecules with chlorine substituents situated on both ends of the molecule or equally distributed throughout the molecule, you end up seeing this really interesting wavy pattern as chlorine content increases. And this is maybe due to the way that the molecules are folding as more chlorines are added, but definitely warrants some further investigation. Meanwhile, molecules with chlorine situated in the middle of the molecule or on just one end of the molecule tended to have higher KDUM values in general, especially at high chlorine contents. So in the second plot, I wanted to see if these patterns would hold true when different isomers, slightly different isomers from the glued SECPs were used. So I made a few of my own, varying the arrangement of the chlorine atoms ever so slightly, and I calculated their log KDUM values using the same exact method and came up with this. So the original patterns that we saw in the glued SECPs have clearly shifted with this um, information quite a bit. And this is because even just small changes in the arrangement of chlorines blur the lines between each of the four designated types of distribution that you see in the legend here. So since these are only slightly different isomers from the glued SCCPs, if anything, this plot is showing us that folding patterns likely have a huge impact on affinity for DOM. Finally, as a way of validating the log KDOM predictions for the glued SCCPs, I compared those results with predictions for those same exact molecules using um, Calculating using, calculated using the Swanee River fulvic acid representative molecule method that you saw in orange earlier. So we already know that we trust the values predicted using the KOW method more, but this is a good comparison to make because the representative DOM molecules can account for functional groups that just aren't present in octanol. So um, you, we would hope that the values would agree somewhat, but you can definitely see that this data looks different overall. So another pathway for further investigation maybe looking into why this, why this is. So finally, there's just a couple things I'd like to say about these conclusions. First of all, all of this data is predicted for partitioning to one specific type of DOM, Swanee River fulvic acid. I focused on this type because it's being used in photodegradation experiments at Bigelow. Um, but in the future, it's going to need to be adapted for marine DOM. Luckily, previous studies have shown that that re linear relationship that we saw with KOW um, can be extrapolated for pretty much any type of DOM. We're just hoping that that relationship will be just as strong when it comes to marine DOM later on. So second, we saw earlier that hexachlorobenzene degrades by this pathway, while lindane does not. These are the KDOM values of hexachlorobenzene and lindane when predicted using this KOW method. So you can see where hexachlorobenzene falls on this plot. Based on this, we would expect that all of these SCCPs, which show to have a higher affinity for DOM than hexachlorobenzene would also be able to degrade by this pathway just because they have an even higher affinity. So we expect with the exception of maybe a couple of these shorter ones, they would also be able to degrade. The impact of this project is that it helps us better understand the DOM system as a whole, as well as this pathway of degradation. And hopefully it can help us make more informed decisions in the future about what chemicals we're using and putting into the environment whether or not they're going to be able to degrade quickly um, by a pathway like this or if they're going to persist for a very long time. So but finally I would just like to give the biggest thank you ever to every single person who made this possible this summer. It's been so wonderful. I want to thank the NSF for funding the projects and um, I really would like to thank Dr. David Fields and my mentors Dr. Chris Epley and Dr. Brian Demento for all of their support. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Julianne Gluch for sharing her KOW data with us. And I would, of course, like to thank my wonderful family who's on this call right now for supporting me through all of this. So, and with that, I would love to take any questions. Sorry, I ran a little bit over time. <laughs> nice job. Other questions internally? I have one. Uh, great talk, Liz, great talk. Um, what about DOM attracts these hydrated electrons? What well, do you know, like the chemistry there? They actually produce them. So the, oh. the sunlight, yeah, as the sunlight causes the DOM to kind of break down, it will um, cause them to produce the hydrated electrons. But it's interesting because actually once the DOM has been in the ocean for a long time, they will um, 
they will start losing their ability to produce them. So if they have been, mm. you know, exposed to a lot of sunlight, then they're kind of become more stable. Right. Good question. Thanks for asking. Of course. Thank you. Okay, I got one. <laughs> so I love the fact that you took a chlor your molecules and you moved around these chlorines and you were looking to see what, what effect that had. I, I mean, I didn't catch that in some of your earlier presentations and it was really an interesting kind of approach in here. And I'm wondering if you could do the same thing in that software to the, um, uh, the DOM molecules. And if you want to speculate for a second on what you think different DOM well, actually, let me ask a different question. Since the <laughs> DOMs uh, change, you know, like in the tropics, you have so few DOMs, and up north, you have a lot of DOMs. I'm wondering if, if you would like to speculate on how long you'd, accept, you'd, you'd expect these uh, toxic molecules to persist in these kind of different environments. Yeah, so definitely the, one of the biggest things that I've seen um, that impacts this, other than the, the effect of the ability of the molecules to even absorb to DOM is the type of DOM that you're seeing. So, for example, humic acids, I've noticed that most partitioning to humic acids is much, much higher than partitioning to any fulvic acid. Um, and it just depends on the complexity of the DOM and how hydrophobic it is. So KOW values in general tend to be much higher than KDOM values, which is why they need to be adjusted. Um, so the, yeah, the more hydrophobic the DOM is, probably the more likely that the chlorinated paraffins will be able to absorb into them. So it definitely, there's a lot of DOM out there to study. <laughs> mm. can, yeah. can you do that inside the software package? Can you manipulate Oh yeah, that? you can, you can move things around however you like inside the software package. It's really cool. Um, mm. you can just change where the functional groups are and things like that. So that's part of it too, like just adjusting the representative molecules. That's great. Uh, there's, uh, Anne is asking, if I understand right, it looks like shorter chlorine chains are going to be harder to remove from the environment. It is, is it known the ratio of shorter versus longer carbon chains? Or is it, that is it known if shorter chlorine chains will combine with one another to form longer chains? Oh, that's an interesting, interesting question. I have never seen anything about, um, about the carbon chains combining with each other. I know that um, so a little while ago when they declared SCCPs as a persistent organic pollutant, it was just short chain chlorinated paraffins. Medium and long chain chlorinated paraffins are still not classified as POPs. And I think part of the reason is toxicity because the, um, because the short chain chlorinated paraffins are more toxic. But we were wondering if maybe part of that was also that they just tend to not be quite as able to break down or they're, they're a little bit more um, able to bioaccumulate. So yeah, that's, that's interesting, interesting mm -hmm. on it. I've never heard of them combining before, but I don't know if that might be something that's possible. Well, that was fantastic. What a great afternoon. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> that was a really, really fabulous.